Let me ask you this question this morning. Have you ever been on a road trip? Anybody? We've all been on road trips. One of our Savannah House residents, Emily Hardwick here in the front, came into my office this morning and was telling me all about this road trip that she and the other two residents are going to be taking on spring break, right? They're going to go, no, not spring break, earlier than that. They're going to go soon to Memphis, Tennessee. And so she was telling me about how excited they were and the things that they're going to get to see when they're on the road trip. But then that conversation quickly moved from what they're excited to see to all the preparation that has to occur. Like they have to pick the right day and time to leave so that they don't leave one of the roommates behind. They have to map it out and see where all their stops are and decide who gets to drive. And I think it comes down to you are the one that was going to make the drive, right? We've all been in that situation where we prepped for a road trip. One of my favorite road trips was in college. I was in an acapella group in college, and we took a road trip with 14 guys. Why are you laughing? Is that, that doesn't surprise you that I was in an acapella group. I know it comes with its uh, perceptions of what that means. It was fun. We took this road trip from San Diego, California, all the way up Interstate 5, all the way the length of California, to the top of Oregon, hitting all our hometowns on the way. We called it Live on the 5 Tour. It was an absolute blast. But there was a lot of planning that had to go into this road trip to make sure that it wasn't more of a disaster than it was. Uh, it was just, it was a beautiful mess of a lot of fun. Road trips, they're just, there's something about them. They're just, they're so fun, but they take a lot of preparation. You have to plan out, whether it's a small trip or a big trip, you have to plan out where you're going, where you're stopping, exactly what you want to pack Make sure you have your toiletries there. Make sure that the car is in, in good running order, right? Well, this morning I want us to take an imaginary road trip together, if you will. Let's imagine that we're, we're all prepped. We've got everything in order and, and it's time to go. At some point in every road trip you can prepare as much as you want, but at some point you just have to say, okay, it's time to hit the road. So this morning we're all in a big car together. We're on a trip together, and it's time to hit the road. I'm going to invite my new friend, Tori Morrow, forward this morning to read our scripture this morning. As she's coming, let me just explain. We're doing this sermon series for the course of Lent for the next six weeks called Simply God, where we're going to be talking about and all the hustle and bustle in life and everything that keeps us busy. It all comes down to God as the source of everything we do. So, Hear the word of the Lord from the book of Ephesians, Tori. If you will please open your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 13, 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he, when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far, far above from all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which in his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tori. Over the course of this series, we are going to be working through the book of Ephesians. There are six chapters in the book of Ephesians. There are six weeks that lead us up to Easter. And so I'd invite you to read along at home. Do your homework. Spend some time in the book of Ephesians. You're welcome to read ahead. We don't have to just stay on track. But every Sunday here in Table of Grace, we'll, we'll cover one chapter at a time. So thank you again. Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, so here we are. We're in our car. We've prepped. It's time to hit the road. We are on the road. Now, now, there's pros and cons to road trips, right? One of the pros is that on a road trip, you get to see some of the most beautiful countryside, some of the most beautiful scenery that you would never get to see if you were in an airplane. You might see it from a different angle, but just 
by definition of this road trip, you have to travel certain roads to get from point A to point B. And so one of the pros is that you get to drive through just God's beauty. One of the cons is that there are places on road trips that are less beautiful, maybe say desolate, uh, and some people find those places beautiful. So that's a matter of opinion. But I think there's this, a law of road trip physics. And I think it goes like this. If something can go wrong on a road trip, it will go wrong in that most desolate location, right? Anybody had an experience like that? I remember when I was five or six years old, my family was in our Volkswagen van again, which I've told you about in the past. And we were in the middle of a desert when we got a flat tire. And so as we pulled over on the side of the road and my dad and brothers were Fixing the tire, I decided to go look for rocks for my rock collection. This is serious business. I found the perfect rock, the perfect rock, and I squatted down to pick up that rock, and I sat on a cactus. Oh, my goodness. Talk about things going from bad to worse. One pair of tweezers and 10,000 cactus needles later... We had the tire back on the van, and we hit the road again. But this is what I'm talking about, this, this law of, of road trip physics. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong, and it will always go wrong in the most desolate location. So here we are on our imaginary road trip this morning, and let's just let's imagine that we have run out of gas in the middle of the desert. What do we do? We start to scramble. One of us just starts running to try to find the nearest gas station. One of us stops and and tries to use our phone to map it out and see where there might be a gas station, even though we're not really getting good reception out here in the middle of nowhere. One of us starts making a sign with a Sharpie that says, need gas, to just hold on the side of the road so that somebody will hopefully drive by and stop and help us. And and one of us might just kind of hunker down and start crying We would all have different reactions to this this feeling of desperation when we are out of fuel. Here we are, middle of nowhere, law of road trip physics on our imaginary trip, out of gas, out of fuel, out of the power that drives us. Now commentators talk about the book of Ephesians, Ephesians as being surrounded by this theme of power. And what historians tell us is that the city of Ephesus was a city that prided itself on power. It was a hub of various trade routes. There were a variety of sources of power that residents would look to to gain notoriety. The Roman Empire upheld the city of Ephesus as one that embodied the power of the empire. And so as a resident of Ephesus, you could choose, how am I going to gain power? How am I going to gain prestige? I have all these various sources to choose from. And I think it's kind of the same as us today in the United States. Here in the United States, we live in a country that that takes pride in its power. in, In being one of the most, if not the most, powerful country in the entire world, we emphasize this idea of power as a nation, and yet there are so many times when on an individual level, it it can feel like we're in the middle of the desert, all alone, and we're out of gas. Can't it? Life has this way of throwing us these curveballs, this law of life physics That something bad will happen, it just does. That's part of life. And when it does, we feel utterly powerless. Whether it's something at your job that's just really burdening you. It's a relationship that has broken recently and it's just, it's weighing you down. Maybe it's somebody who used to respect you and all of a sudden doesn't and you can't quite figure out why. There are a a variety of experiences we all go through that just seem to take the wind out of our sails, the fuel out of our tank, that leave us feeling stranded 
on the middle of a road trip with no options. And so we scramble. We scramble to find a source of power. Some of us scramble to find power in, in our education. Some of us scramble to find power in our bank accounts, in our investment portfolios. Some of us look to find power in the weight room or the yoga studio. Some of us look to find power in joining PTAs or social organizations or committees. Whatever it is, we look everywhere we can to find a source of power. When life has thrown us that curveball and all of a sudden we just feel powerless. Okay, so let's go back to this road trip. Here we are on our road trip in the middle of the desert. We've run out of gas and we're all scrambling, each person doing something different to try to find more fuel for our car. Four hours go by. Five hours go by. Most of us are just beginning to give up. Maybe we should start looking for shelter and pretend like we know how to build a fire. I don't know. We're, we're in desperation mode here. When somebody goes to the trunk of the car and opens it up for the first time and says, hey, guys, guys did you know that there's a, a gas can back here? And it's full. And we all run to see this new discovery, and we can't tell if we should be upset because we didn't think of looking in the trunk of the car or be elated because the source of fuel has been there the entire time. But then one of us looks at the label on the gas can and says, this isn't just regular cheap gas that we always put in our car. Look at this label. It says it's super duper premium Binford 3000 zero emissions gasoline. I mean, this stuff is like beyond reason. And it's been there the whole time. You see, in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, this is the problem that Paul is addressing. If you go back and you read the whole chapter later today or sometime this week, I would encourage you to, you'll notice that in the very first section, he uses this word Lord over and over as he's talking about Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. It's not unintentional. It's not just habitual. It's not just a title. It is a political, motivated a word that gets across this idea of where the true power lies. In this city where citizens are looking for sources of power all over, scrambling to find something that will lift them to prestige, Paul says, Jesus is your source of power. More than anything that the Roman Empire could ever offer you, your true source of power should be Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. He is your true king. After the introduction in the next section, the second section of the first chapter, Paul begins to talk about our position as God's chosen people, as these people that God has thought of and pictured of and intended to use since the beginning of creation. God has chosen us to embody God's love to the world. This started with the nation of Israel and then through Jesus was expanded to everyone who would believe in him. We are to embody God to this world. And he's very carefully about emphasizing the end which says none of this chosenness is for our glory but for God's. Out of anything we could ever try to do on our own, it all boils down to the source of our power in the first place, to God. And then in this third section that we just heard read, Paul prays for the people in Ephesus. And he says, it's my prayer that your eyes would be opened to the power that is within you that you would recognize that the power in you is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Whoa. 
That is incredible. The same power that is within each one of us is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And it's been sitting in that tank in the trunk all along. This is powerful news, friends. This changes everything. Okay, back in our road trip. We've gone to the desert. We've run out of gas. We've scrambled. We've found the tank of super-duper premium Binford 3000 zero emission gasoline. We've filled the tank. Everybody gets back into their seats. Finally, here we go, back on the road. We had to get the guy back who started running. We'll pick him up on the way. But when we start the car... All of a sudden, it sounds like a Ferrari. When we step on the gas, it accelerates like it's never accelerated before. This car is no longer the car that we began with. It can go 350 miles an hour. And when you have a car that can go 350 miles an hour, and let's just, for the sake of this metaphor, say that it had some sort of straight road ahead of it in a super force field that made it invisible to all the police who might be looking at it. This changes things. All of a sudden, you don't need to plan all those stops on the way. You don't need to worry about anything on this road trip because you can get from point A to point B like that. Everything has changed because of the fuel that you placed in the tank. Because of the power that you've discovered, our road trip has been transformed. You can see where I'm going with this, right? When we discover the fuel, the power, the power of Christ that raised Jesus from the dead, when we open ourselves to that power in our own lives, it changes everything. When we trust God enough to say, use that power within me, watch out. We find ourselves doing things we could never imagine. When you open yourself to the power of God in your life, not on your agenda, but on God's, you find yourself doing things beyond reason, beyond your plans, beyond what you could imagine. You might find yourself looking at people differently. With the power of God within you, you might find yourself with a a new lens of compassion for every single person, for people that you thought you could never look at without judging first. You might find yourself using your resources for the kingdom of God and not just for your own nest egg or investments. You might find yourself going on mission trips across the world or joining one of our mission teams here around the United States or even getting involved with one of our programs here locally to make a difference. You might find yourself making that a priority and not just a supplement to your schedule. You will find yourself finding creative ways To remove yourself from arguments when they don't matter, and even more creative ways to step in when they do. When you open yourself to the power of God in your life, you will find yourself being released from the sins that have held you down from the habits in your life that you've developed that build a wall between life like this and the thriving Binford 3,000, 350 miles an hour, straight shot, bigger than you could ever imagine life that God has designed for you to live. It's my prayer this morning that together we would open ourselves 
to that power. That we would have the courage to say, okay, God, this is not about me. It's all about you. Use me for your purposes. Amen? Amen.